we're going to have a few minutes of a special. There's something extraordinary happened this week. Dave Louthan will be with us. Dave is the man who on December 26th slaughtered, actually slaughtered with his own hands, the cow that was later discovered to be the mad cow that caused all the controversy. Now the USDA is saying the problem's over. Dave Louthan is saying, not so. He's warning us, be careful. So stay with us after Bud because it, this is a very serious stuff. Bud, as wife Carol Rainey, and he have written an, a phenomenal new book called Sight Unseen, Science, UFO, Invisibility, and Transgenic Beings. Carol is a distinguished documentarist in her own right. She has done documentaries and dramas for PBS, for cable networks, international TV. Uh, recently, she did a, a program called What's New About Menopause for Nova. Uh, she has done uh, animated children's videos, uh, also other work for PBS. Uh, so these two extraordinary and distinguished people have come together to publish what I believe is very arguably the finest book on the abduction experience ever written, an awesome volume indeed, and welcome both of you to my radio program. Thanks a lot, Whitley. Well, thank you. That's a rather uh, <clears throat> extravagant and uh flattering introduction. I very much appreciate it. Oh, it's all entirely false. <laughs> no, I'm joking. It's not false. It's absolutely heartfelt, every bit of it. Right. And uh, now let's go, Bud, you know, I hardly know where to begin in, in uh, talking to, the two, to you or to the two of you, because uh, sight unseen, it, it, it gradually becomes overwhelming, the evidence that is presented in the book. And uh, uh, it, it just the the, the there are su there is such so many there are so many directions it goes in. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the early some of the witnesses and some of the things like invisibility that that you discuss in the early part of the book. Because a, a large part of the book is about the about accepting the reality of the technologies that makes this look makes the abduction experience look like magic and look like dreams when it's not uh, right. it, it, in a strange way i think uh, the basic goal summarized <clears throat> of the book was to take the para out of paranormal and to make uh, the uh, uh, the distance between normal uh, cutting edge human uh, technology and alien technology to, to reduce that margin as much as possible, and I think that's uh, that's what the, the book attempted. And, and with Carol's involvement with uh, cutting edge science here, I think we, we've, we're getting close to that idea. Well, yeah, it let's you know uh, you, you start off with the, there are ex some cases in here like the Katharina case, which involves invisibility, and uh, and a person essentially disappearing from a public place. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? And please, Carol, just speak up when you want to. I'm asking you both right. about these, these cases. <clears throat> well, Whitney, the thing about uh, Katharina and about the idea of invisibility and what we mean by that is that during abductions, uh, most, if not practically all of the time, uh, researchers have come, like myself, have come to believe that the UFO is unseeable by any potential witnesses. Abductions could take place in downtown Manhattan or Paris or Chicago, and nobody sees the craft. No one also sees the aliens uh, coming down a beam of light or whatever and entering a building, and no one sees the abductees being lifted back up into the craft. Uh, the only exception being, of course, the uh, Linda Cortilla case, which was uh, deliberately staged so the maximum number of people would see it. But... We've always now, when you say deliberately staged so the maximum number of people would see it, that's quite a statement. Why do you say that? Well, <clears throat> because, I mean, that's to get into that case, uh, which is yeah, complicated go ahead. enough. Let's, that's all right. We can get into it a little bit. But uh, the basic point here was uh, a procession of cars with diplomats aboard uh, heading down South Street to, you know, on the east side of Manhattan in 1989 and at the end of November. And this was right at the time international politics were absolutely a boil. Uh, the Berlin Wall was about to come down. There was a general strike in, uh, in um, Czechoslovakia. Poland was falling apart. The, uh, the 
um, Russian Empire, so to speak, was falling apart, and there were meetings and chaos at the United Nations, and this group of important people were driving down at 3 in the morning the uh, down South Street, heading towards uh, the ferry terminal so that they could be f- taken to uh, Governor's Island, where they would take helicopters to another international meeting, high, uh, highly placed people in these cars, and all of those cars were stopped, apparently, by the UFO uh, interference with their electrical systems, and when they were stopped as if the audience had been put in its seats, then and only then the UFO above the nearby apartment building turned off all of its lights in full view of this procession of extremely important international figures, and Linda Cortila was floated out a 12-story window in full view of everybody along with the aliens, and it, it, the story goes on from there. But essentially, it was as if the UFO occupants were making a demonstration. They could have done all this in complete darkness and invisibility. And in fact, nobody saw Linda Cortilla being returned to her apartment at the end of the abduction. So you have to assume that this is a deliberate act. I may be wrong there, but uh, all the evidence suggests it was. But my point is that invisibility, as it, it seems to have been from the beginning, an aspect of the abduction phenomenon, or the abduction technology, one might say. Yes. Uh, the only way these abductions can take place, and I mean, I had somebody taken off a balcony of a hotel in daytime in Beverly Hills. Uh, somebody was taken out of a 22nd story window of a building uh, next door to the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I mean, these things can't happen without witnesses. Now, tell so, us a little bit about th- th- those two cases. They both sound absolutely fascinating. Well, uh, <clears throat> the, the case that happened uh, in New York City, uh, a resident of the what is called the Museum Tower, the building next to the Museum of Modern Art. Right. A very asleep. lovely building, I might add. Yeah. She woke up, and the, and the uh, room was filled with light, and uh, she couldn't move, and uh, uh, her husband was not there next to her. Where he should have been. She was floated out the window, ultimately, and uh, she found that he had been floated out the window, too, into a craft that was hovering let's say, 10 feet outside the window of the 22nd floor. Now, if if there was anybody walking anywhere around or looking out of the window of a neighboring building, they would have seen this happen. This was, let's say, 2 or 3 in the morning, but there are lots of people up. And uh, th- these sorts of things happen all the time. In my in my book, I, I go into uh, a case where two little girls were abducted uh, from their house in, uh, in Queens. Uh, this right. was a a row house, and uh, uh, they they remember some some little odd bits that suggest the abduction consciously, and the one little girl decided it's time to go home. That she they'd been playing in the basement uh, where they always played, where they had her friend had uh, her toys and so forth. And when they went outside, uh, she started home. There were police outside, and neighbors, and all kinds of people standing around. Uh, along with uh, her friend's, the other little girl's mother, w- wailing and crying because the kids had disappeared. And everyone was totally shocked. Where have you been? And yeah. they said, we've been in the basement. And the police and everyone else apparently searched the whole building, and the neighborhood was being searched, and the mothers were c- calling out for the children and so forth. So uh, this all took place in the afternoon, and nobody saw them be- being taken out or, or put back. So My God. And when you get into this, invisibility seems to be uh, essential. And yet, uh, what happened for me, Whitley, was uh, from the beginning when we began to suspect this. But we need to take a, we need to take just a little break here. This okay. is Whitley Strieber at Streamland. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back with Bud Hopkins and Carol Rainey. You need to learn more about Bud Hopkins and his work. Go to the Intruders Foundation website. That's intrudersfoundation.org. And you can begin to explore the work of an extraordinary man, a real pioneer. We were talking about invisibility. What would be some of the possible technologies that might be behind this? Well, the, uh, of course, we don't really know, but uh, what we began to explore, uh, what Carol began to explore, actually, was what was happening in uh, various laboratories 
and I you know, in, in, over the, the at this yeah, point. In, in the military especially, but let me uh, just uh, speak briefly about the easiest way to, to um, become invisible is to work with the fact that in the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, which are all of the waves of energy from microwaves, radio, infrared, mm-hmm. x-rays, they're energy waves that make up the entire electromagnetic spectrum in the universe, we think, and that human beings can only see a tiny little range, a little spectrum in the visible spectrum. And craft could, for example, UFOs could take advantage of the fact that we have such a narrow range that we only see the tip of the iceberg or hear the tip of the iceberg of what's around us. The craft, um, and it's too long to go into, but it's related to the craft propulsion system as a possibility that it emits radiation at an energy level that's too high or too low for human perception in the, you know, a common, um, commonly known aspect of that is a dog whistle because it, it's, it emits um, a sound that's far too high pitched for human beings to hear. So we, we invent all of these instruments in order to be able to deal with x-rays and gamma rays and radio waves, which are also part of television. Um, but so th- that's just a, a really basic way that a craft could work within the limits of what we can see and hear. Um, but then as you get into the actual technologies that are being developed, you know, the military is always uh, will be one that goes for the high-end technologies first, and they're working on stealth technologies that um, involve everything from getting the cross-section of a plane down to the size of a bird right. in terms of what it shows up on in, um, in the uh, radar. And then there are sensor and display systems that NASA is working on that basically uh, have little tiny cameras, let's say, on one side of a moving craft. And that would send um, electrical signals onto the front side of the craft, which would basically be like a large screen projection. So you could have a craft or a tank moving through an environment. Oops, sorry, my cat, noisy. Um, (laughs) The tank would be moving through an environment. Uh, It would be reflecting on its front side the, the environment it's passing through. So if, you're, if it's moving through clouds, you'd see clouds in, in place of the actual object. All yeah. kinds of technologies, in other words, that we're going toward that somebody who was proficient with could use to their own great advantage. But, you know, I have to tell you, by the way, I, I just was so disturbed by, I guess I've been disturbed since the Linda Cortili case, because anyone who's had close encounter experiences wants to be in places where they don't happen. And when you're telling me about people being floated out of the windows of the 22nd floor in Manhattan, it just seems like there's no place that this that you can be safe from this. And I have to ask, is there any place, Bud or, or Carol, either one of you, that, that this where this would be unlikely to happen or less likely to happen? Well, I actually can't think of any, to tell you the truth. And That's too bad. Discussing, unfortunately. Yes. Uh, would that uh, there were such places that I don't know about them. <clears throat> uh, you know, Whitley, I've had one woman I worked with has been abducted. I've worked with her for a number of years, and we've looked into experiences that occurred in about four different locations in, o- in Ohio and two different locations in West Virginia and three or four different locations in Washington, D.C., and at least three different locations in New York City, and one location in Brazil, and at least two locations in uh, Spain. <laughs> so it yeah. doesn't seem that uh, there's any getting away from it. Well, that's a shame, because I feel like I've, I've, I've been personally wanting to move again. I've moved, I think, uh, since mm-hmm. it happened to me about ten times, and uh, I'm getting ready to go again. And uh, I, maybe it's a useless, just a useless gesture. I don't know. Well, you know, my advice is always to uh, to move if you really want to make the move to live in the new place or you're tired of the old place or something, but not to move because you assume it will somehow make you less findable. Uh, I think that uh, to to make moves or change careers or change relationships or so on because 
of some perceived sense of what it may or may not do to help you with the alien phenomenon, uh, I think that's uh, not a sufficient reason to make these dramatic moves. Uh, but no reason not to move if you really don't, are tired you know, of where you are. In my own personal case, I'll try yeah, exactly, anyway. Exactly, it to a new place. Uh, the... Uh uh, let's, Carol. I would like to know a little bit about your odyssey because uh, you have suddenly come to this and you are taking it seriously. And yet, the the background that your your work suggests would make me think that you would be among the people who would sort of initially dismiss this as as being um, being a, a bunch of uh, confusion and illusions and so forth. Well. I would have thought so, too. And um, I was doing doctoral work in future studies, so maybe that indicates I had uh, an open mind. I was actually um, applying for the L5 Society back in the early 80s to um, go live on the moon, but I had not ever heard of unidentified flying objects. I mean, just seriously hadn't. When you live in an academic world, that does not come across your desk and um, then went on to work in uh, quite a bit of um, medical and scientific documentaries. Um, I, I just began talking to Bud, um, what, eight years ago when we met, and I was shocked and yet intrigued. And it's always about keeping your mind open enough to go to, to do the homework and then decide what you think. You know, just check your ego at the door. Right. And that's uh, crucial. Uh, Carol, speaking uh, of checking our egos, we're both going to have to do it because we have to take a little bit of a break. <laughs> right. You are listening to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland Online. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back with Carol Rainey, Bud Hopkins, Sight Unseen, Science, UFO, Invisibility, and Transgenic Beings, a huge title for a truly remarkable book, A Journey into the un Abduction Experience, unlike anything you've ever read before. Uh, uh, Bud has written some incredible and powerful books, and uh, this is right up there with the very most powerful of, of them all, and... Uh, now, Carol, we were just talking before we left the air about the experience of kind of coming to this. And one of the things that, the, that is suggested at times in the book uh, is about the control of abductees uh, by their experience mm -hmm. and even, even their complete, being completely taken over. And I was just thinking to myself, could it be the other way, way around? Maybe... The abductees are the ones who are not under control because we can see something of what's happening to us, and the rest of the society is in some sort of induced state of denial because how can anybody deny this, and yet they do routinely. They just ignore it. Mm. Well, I would tend to think, though, that that's... The, the denial is more in any part of the human nature, uh, aided and abetted by a government cover-up and the ridicule factor. I don't know that the aliens are controlling people's denial. I don't know if that's what you meant. Well, I, 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 I might, maybe. Uh, I, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I'm just speculating. Mm -hmm. I'm just yeah. asking how, what you think no, about it. No, I have, I have no idea how that happens, but I know that, that one of the ideas that got us, um, one, uh, one of the um, incidents that got us to think about doing this book was an example of um, co-option, if you will, or taking a mind control that actually happens in nature. A, um, I don't know if you have time for me to tell that sure, story of please, the Sure, please, that's what we're here you for. Know, the, um, our friend Anne Cuvillier handed us this article from a uh, New York Times science section, and we had been speaking earlier that day about Bud's idea that... Um, Aliens sometimes seem to be able to take over or co-opt the human unwillingly into doing work for them. And nobody knows how that would happen. But here's how it happens in the rainforest in Costa Rica. Um, there's a parasitic wasp 
that preys on the orb weaving spider. Get ready for this, folks. And this is an incredible story. <laughs> it's uh, named the orb weaving spider because it spins a perfectly round web. But what this wasp does is it attacks the spider, temporarily paralyzes it, lays an egg on the tip of the spider's abdomen. And, um, of course, the spider can't reach that. So when it goes back to doing its daily web spinning, um, the, the larva of the wasp clings to its belly and just so slowly sucks the life out of the spider. But the night before the spider then takes, the wasp takes the spider's life, it somehow redirects the spider to do a, to build a totally different sort of structure. Um, instead of spending, spinning its round web, the wasp, and they think it's by some chemical process that the, the wasp injects into the spider's brain, the spider begins weaving this thick lateral cable, which when the spider is then dead, the wasp climbs out of its larva and it takes up its, builds its nest in the, um, the thick lateral weavings that the spider has created exactly for it up in the treetops before it dies. And that, uh, just to finish that, uh, the, um, <clears throat> this of course, uh, the reason this is done is so the uh, the, uh, the larva is protected from all of its uh, predators. It's up right. in the air. Mm-hmm. And what happens, uh, the other interesting thing is when this was being replicated in the laboratory with uh, uh, spiders with, and wasps that was brought in, <clears throat> and they took the larva <clears throat> excuse me, away from the, uh, orb, uh, the spider uh, just before it dies, uh, the spider recovers and goes back to its normal activity of spinning round webs again. It's as if it's been sort of taken over and controlled, although we don't know how. And the analogy, of course, here is with uh, something that's been widely reported, in that we have abductees who find themselves aboard a craft and aiding and abetting the uh, UFO occupants by calming down other abductees and even find themselves dressed in in a kind of a, tight blue jumpsuits as if they're part of the alien uh, crew. And when this is all over, uh, they remember this sometimes and sometimes in great detail and feel incredible remorse that they have participated in uh, the abduction of a fellow human being. So we know that uh, from at least case reports that this happens in the alien phenomenon and, and when we discovered this spider thing, we found a kind of a small-scale analogy, but one which is in its own way just as mysterious. But one which does suggest that there could be something as simple as a drug that could be used to... We we have no way of knowing. No way of knowing. But now, tell us about the case. I'm trying to remember it from the book of uh, the lady who came back with and reported under hypnosis the knowledge of... uh, of undersea creatures and so forth, and uh, well, that's that's actually the Linda Cortilla case. That is the Linda Cortilla case. When she case. was um, abducted, uh, along with the uh, several of these extremely important political figures, as if the aliens were trying to uh, teach them a lesson about uh, their goals, whether these lessons are truthful or not. I mean, whether their goals are, are being accurately stated. Uh, Linda was taken to uh, a seashore. This is late at night, and. Um, there were these uh, uh, three distinguished uh, a dip- people, a diplomat and, uh, and two uh, high security people, sitting on the sand. And she walked up to them and started berating them for their treatment of the environment. And uh, began. she picked up a dead uh, bluefish or something on the beach, which she said she, she doesn't even like to touch the fish with the fillet in her own no. kitchen. And she waved this at them and said, see what you've done, and she seemed to know the names of various minerals and uh, the components of the sand there. And uh, when all of this was over, of course, she was back to being Linda again, having no idea how she knew all of this about the various elements that made up the uh, quality of the sand. And she couldn't understand why she was berating her fellow human beings when she should have been on their side rather than the alien side. So it, it, she, she felt really kind of embarrassed 
about her behavior. So here we have again something where uh, she recognized in herself that she possessed knowledge that she was not aware of and that yes. she was behaving in ways that she was ashamed of later. And, you know, this this aspect of the experience, it suggests to I me, mean, it worries me, of course, because I had an implant put in my left ear, which I remember having done, and there was an attempt made to remove it, and it moved on its own power out from under the surgeon's scalpel, and he concluded the surgery because he did not know what to make of it. It, it wasn't, uh, he had been led to believe that it was a cyst, and when he saw this white disc-shaped object that actually moved away from his scalpel under its own power, he immediately closed the wound because he wasn't uh, satisfied that he knew what he was doing anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it's still there. Mm -hmm. And it, it it's very disturbing, of course, to someone in the public eye because, you know, I would hate to be a, a shill, basically, for evil aliens. And, 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 and it's why I've tried to be careful to extend my, in my radio program especially, interviews beyond the limits of you know people who think they had terrific and wonderful experiences which i did it first until i remembered more it took me 10 15 years to remember but uh i'd like to um stop there for a second and put the idea of implants and uh being trained to cooperate into a context that is very very much like that of how human researchers use primates in laboratories. Okay, we're going to we're going to do that, right. but we're going to do it in just a couple minutes because we're going to take a little bitty break right here. This is Whitley Strieber's Dreamland. Uh, we'll be right back. Bud Hopkins and Carol Rainey, sight unseen, very simply, one of the best, the most convincing, the most complete, the most amazing books about abduction that you have ever read. When you read this and realize that science just rejects the whole thing out of hand, you'll understand something. Somebody out there is crazy, and it's not Bud Hopkins, and it's not Carol Rainey, and it's not the people this is happening to. The scientific community has dropped the ball big time. Time. Sight unseen. Don't miss it. Get it from the unknowncountry.com store. Get it today. Find out for yourself what's really going on here. This is Dreamland with Whitley Strieber. We're back talking to Bud Hopkins and Carol Rainey. Their book, Sight Unseen, Science, UFO, Invisibility, and Transgenic Beings. Their website, intrudersfoundation.org. Do you think there's anything in this? Uh, get into it, because there really is. Abductions are real. Something is happening, and we need to understand it and be aware of it. Uh, Bud Hopkins has said many times, extraordinary experiences demand an extraordinary response from, from the rest of us, and science is not ex uh, responding to this in the right way with the result that who or whatever's out there has a completely free reign. They can do whatever they want to us because we remain passive. Don't you remain passive. Go to the Intruders Foundation. Get this book. Get involved. Okay, Carol, before we left the air, we were talking about, uh, uh, just begin, beginning to talk about this idea of implants and co-opting and control. Mm -hmm. It's terribly important. Let's continue with that. Well, what I've done in Sight and Seen, as often as I can, is to pull some parallels between what is happening in, in the UFO world, um, or those experiences, and make those analogous to things that are happening in the world of science. And one of the, one of the aspects um, that I found that quite startled me, you know, I, I'm in Bud's house, I have these people come in and out of our house day and night, and I hear these, I hear the patterns. And here's what happened in May of 1997. There was a convention um, called UPREN, E-U-P-R-E-N, which was um, a meeting of scientists who work with uh, non-human primates, the great apes and monkeys. And these animals are often used because, uh, as models for human exper experimentation because they're so close to um, you know, hu humans' um, DNA and um, neurologically they're very similar. 
So um, our scientists are using them, and if it is conceivable that aliens are using us for a similar purposes, experimentation, um, trying to find out about um, our neurology, or maybe even something about themselves. Here are some of the patterns that um, were put forward by these, this group of scientists in how to handle um, uh, non-human primates, the great apes. And you'll find that they're eerily similar to UFO abduction reports. The scientists and their protocols set up it's best to study the behavior of a species in its natural habitat. In other words, leave us here going about our lives, breeding, uh, having our society, um, and study us that way because captivity causes stress and that skews the data. Um, another one of the protocols that scientists would use for great apes is to reuse the animal over and over again, treating them with great care. You don't want to wipe out an animal that you have a great deal of time and money invested in. So you're careful of it um, so that you can continue to use it. Um, another protocol would be training the animal to cooperate with experimental procedures because that leads to, leads to less stress and more accurate measurements. Um, implant, I'll just give you one more. In implanting technologies inside the research animals. And... Um, they're, that's considered to have revolutionized the collection of physiological data from the um, experimental apes. And when you combine that with the advances in nanotechnology and you, you extend it out, say, a few hundred years or even less, you have a situation where these beings could be injecting people with sophisticated, extraordinarily sophisticated mm -hmm. technologies, mm -hmm. and you have to think that the kind of implants that uh, people like Dr. Roger Lear pop out of folks mm -hmm. are actually old technology that's been abandoned. Right. Right. Um, although his last implant, in, interestingly enough, was found to be broadcasting on two different FM bands, mm -hmm. which was mm -hmm. pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, FM frequencies, I mean, excuse me. So, no, I think without a doubt, device we can already um, develop implantable devices that allows remote allow remote monitoring of right. the being that it's in. You know, one of, one of the things really about um, <clears throat> implants is that when we first uh, started thinking about this and dealing with it, I, I believe. Uh, uh, Ray Fowler was the first to mention such a thing in a Betty Andreessen case where she remembers a small ball being inserted in the nostril, which right. has been replicated hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times since then. But the point is that uh, uh, the, um, the, the thinking that we had at the time was, of course, very anthropomorphic and out of our current technology. So we, uh, since we're so busy putting uh, uh, transmitters on to the ears of right. polar bears and so forth, I, our cat, we have to follow yeah, that's, support, uh, but he's the, just the, saying he's a member of the family. Bud and Carol have a resident alien. It's actually not a cat. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let him go ahead and pretend. Right. It's an orb-weaving uh, uh, cat. <laughs> <laughs> right. But at uh, any rate, uh, we, we thought that since we were putting, uh, you know, uh, little transmitters on animals and setting them free, that that must be what this is, a kind of a locator. And, of course, when you really think about it, uh, uh, it, it's highly possible that every single human being emits a certain uh, electronic signal uh, of some sort, uh, which would make them easily identifiable. I'm theorizing here. But that uh, implants may have all kinds of functions which we have not yet been able even to. We're going to talk about implants in more detail in just a minute. This is Whitley Strieber's Dreamland. We'll be back with Bud Hopkins and Carol Rainey. Get their book Sight Unseen from the UnknownCountry.com store. Bud Hopkins and Carol Rainey, Sight Unseen, very simply, one of the best, the most convincing, the most complete, the most amazing books about abduction that you have ever read. When you read this and realize that science just rejects the whole thing out of hand, you'll understand something. Somebody out there is crazy, and it's not Bud Hopkins, and it's not Carol Rainey, and it's not the people this is happening to. The scientific community has dropped the ball big time. 
sight unseen. Don't miss it. Get it from the unknowncountry.com store. Get it today. Find out for yourself what's really going on here. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland, bringing you the news from unknowncountry.com. Unknowncountry.com, daily news of the edge. You can't get it anywhere else. Now, here's unknowncountry.com news editor Ann Strieber. This week, we reported that spontaneous fires have broken out in a village in Italy, and no one can figure out what's causing them. It can't be electricity since the power has been cut off. Washing machines, dishwashers, refrigerators, electricity meters, and cables have been spontaneously bursting into flames, and there's no evidence of arson. Keep checking our website for a solution to that mystery. What will we do if ET contacts us? An international agreement called the Declaration of Principles Concerning Activities Following the Detection of Extraterrestrial Intelligence lays out the basic rules for contact. The scientists who signed the declaration must agree to keep the news about contact secret until the government has been alerted. As soon as SETI detects a radio signal from aliens, the International Telecommunications Union will ask governments around the world to stop using that part of the radio band so communication can be established. The newspaper in Darwin, Australia, had a classified ad that read, In 1972, I saw a UFO at 5 a.m. over Darwin Airport with three other gentlemen. After 31 years, I would like to make contact again with the other witnesses. Two were security guards from the Darwin Airport. The other was Fred, whose father was the caretaker at the Darwin German Club. Please contact me. Rodney Jarvis, who wants to contact the other witnesses, says the UFO he saw was a very large orange light moving very slowly, just above the tops of the houses. Almost every culture has legends of wise men coming from far off, bringing technology with them. Popular Dreamland guest William Henry often talks about this. Now researchers have found evidence of this at Stonehenge. DNA tests on the skeleton of the man known as the Amesbury Archer, who was buried nearby, reveal he wasn't English, but came from either Switzerland, Austria, or Germany. Archaeologists think he brought the knowledge necessary to bring to build Stonehenge with him. What's especially interesting is that Otzi, the 5,000-year-old ice man whose body was found in melting ice in the Alps a few years ago, probably came from the same culture. This was a highly developed prehistoric society that has been completely lost in time. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. Now let's get back to Bud Hopkins and Carol Rainey. Bud, we were just talking about implants. Let's get back to that. That's a fascinating subject. There may be there might be a quality of human being which we are as yet unaware of, something we possess, just as in the... You know, let's say the 12th century, blood was blood, and nobody knew that certain people had a blood type different than other people. So if you were looking for type O negative in 1206, nobody would know what you're talking about. Right. So we may have some qualities that we are yet unaware of and that the implants are monitoring those as yet totally unknown qualities. So we have no idea what they're doing. Which what they're m- doing. might explain also why certain people are abducted and others aren't. Although exactly. it seems like they're looking for people who are easy to control. There's a chicken and the egg problem here uh, with that. Because, you know, you might say that if you find... Uh, 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 one thing you do find amongst uh, abductees very often is uh, a um, uh, problems around the issue of anger, either yeah. the inability to express anger or or an inappropriate expression of anger with with no particular cause. And I would imagine that if you just and I'm making some jump here, if you did a, a study of uh, uh, adult men who had been sexually abused by the Roman Catholic clergy, say. You may find that they're, gen- they're gentle people, they're, there's a, a sort of shyness, there might be problems with anger, but it might be a psychological profile not very different than abductees. And so you're saying that, it's a, that, that it could be that the uh, profile is stress-related, and, and it has to do with a response to a hidden trauma or a barrier. Yes, exactly. That, yeah. that, that, uh, well, that's where I said the, the uh, chicken and the egg situation, that the psychological profile may be due to having shared the same kinds of experiences rather than being innately the same kind of person. Well, it took me 17 years to finally get to what actually happened to me on the night I was abducted because of the trauma involved and the humiliation. 17 years, and I finally have gotten past it. 
and been able to actually talk about it on this radio program, and which was a huge, huge thing for me. And uh, I, I'm still scarred. I think I don't think I'll ever not be scarred. I think that the that all abductees are scarred. And I want to get back to the question of what is happening. In other words, it seems to me hard to believe that it would be like a, something like a scientific study. It seems more like they're taking something from us. Are they experimenting on us, or is there something being harvested from us on a regular basis? <clears throat> well, uh, Willie, it's a good question. Of course, it has to be picked up by the human end. We, we really don't know uh, the alien mind or agenda or so, so on, except uh, to the extent that we can infer it from what seems to be happening to human beings. And uh, I, David Jacobs has long ago said that this is not an experiment. Uh, it's, it's gone on too long yeah. it, with too much intensity. Uh, it, it seems to me more a process that is understood. And as, as far as I'm concerned, the, the one thing we can say absolutely for, uh, about <clears throat> what is happening is that th it has this reproductive center. In other words, uh, sperm and ova samples are taken. There are these uh, what seems to be an attempt to create a, a mix of human and alien characteristics, what I call originally hybrids that uh, is not technically correct, it, as Carol has pointed out, uh, this is a kind of genetic engineering situation, and these are transgenic beings that are being created. Now, that seems to be what's definitely going on, and uh, there seems to be an interest in perhaps what the mix might be of, uh, let's say, human being number 6,382 and alien number 400 and whatever, as if the, the uh, uh, creation of these mixed uh, creatures is um, maybe does have an experimental edge uh, to it but the basic question we have to face is why are they creating all of these these mixes what are these people going to do and I say people uh, but um, what's what's the ultimate purpose are they going to simply uh, hop in their spaceships and leave and populate uh, Mars or something or uh, are they going to infiltrate? Are they going to take over? Are they going to change us? Uh, I mean, there's no way of knowing. We don't have any idea about that. But the reproductive focus is certainly the one thing that's concrete that we can say for sure. It's so unbelievably horrible, and yet it, uh, and yet there seems to be on the government's side a substantial amount of knowledge, but no action. And but you've you God knows where you, you you've been over the years trying to get help. What is your impression of why it remains sitting on its hands? Is it being coerced, or is it just unable to protect us and not willing to admit that? Or what's going on in your well? You know, I, uh, of course, we don't know for sure, but I think the latter suggestion you just made is is probably closer to the truth. But that's just a, a guess on my part. Uh, what I've always said, uh, rather humorously, but uh, seriously, too, is that if all a president can say is that they're here, my fellow Americans, they can now fly us, they can do whatever they want to do, they're abducting systematically our men, women, and children on a, on a, a regular basis, uh, they are uh, carrying out intrusive procedures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's no communication between us, uh, we don't know how this is going to turn out, they can now fly anything we have, but uh, we don't know whether they're going to turn out to be friendly or not, we'll let you know when we hear more. Thank you and good night. <laughs> and I always said at that point I would rather be in the liquor business than the uh, bond market. Right. Yeah. You can certainly see why why they uh, would not be would not be willing to, uh, to to say that. We're coming up toward the end of the show, and but I uh, and Carol, before we go, I just I want to take a change. One of the most extraordinary stories in this uh, in this extraordinary book is the elusive Mr. Page. And I, 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 if we have can do it in about three minutes, I'd love to, if you could tell us a little bit about Anne Marie and, and Mr. Page. Carol, why don't you uh, go into that a little bit? Well, I think that's your story. I'll talk about any science, but you tell the well, story. Well, essentially, uh, uh, the woman uh, Anne Marie, who I wrote about, uh, is, is an abductee who had come to me a number of years ago, and in amongst the various experiences she was telling me, she finally brought up the fact that there was a very strange man named Mr. Page who came to live with her family when she was a very little girl. And this man was extremely strange. Uh, he had no visible means of support, no identification, no money. Uh, and he wanted to live with them and uh, live in the basement uh, where there wasn't even any running water, uh, at least anywhere near him. 
they had no idea of any connection that this man had with the real world. He looked peculiar, um, and he developed this intense connection with Anne-Marie from the age of about three. And her mother has said to me, I can't understand how I ever let Mr. Page just simply take my little girl off uh, almost daily for these walks down into uh, a, a woods where there was a cow pasture and so forth. And uh, Anne-Marie could never remember exactly what happened when they went down there. But uh, the whole experience was extremely eerie, and yet she felt very attached to this man. And the man would send her postcards. He would simply disappear and say he's going away. He would send her a letter, and uh, interspersed in the letter were symbols, which are the kinds of symbols which many abductees have reported seeing inside the craft. She didn't know what they meant at the time, although she has subsequently come up with some of the same symbols. Mm -hmm. uh, he was sending her uh, telepathic messages, and she was receiving them and dealing with them when he was away. The man, when he was asked where he came from, uh, he would simply point straight up and say, I came from up north, pointing to the sky. The implication is that somehow or other, uh, he was mediating between the aliens and her and was not himself uh, fully human. In other words, the very kind of transgenic being that uh, we were, we've been talking about more or less throughout the show, which is just so weird. And I guess it was Carl Sagan, wasn't it, who said that uh, if we really did have encounters with aliens, it would be strange beyond the strangest thing we could possibly imagine. Uh, absolutely. And, and that, <laughs> once that turns out to be true, then the skeptics community says, well, basically it's too strange. It must be people must be dreaming it up. <laughs> Well, it's been a real pleasure having the two of you. Next up, Dave Louth and Mad Cow Disease. Do not miss this. You are listening to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland Online. But this is Whitley Strieber. We are talking to Dave Louth and the... A couple of a few days ago, there was an extraordinary story, in fact, a riveting story in the New York Times to the effect that the man who had been involved in the slaughter of the downer cow that was said by government to have had mad cow disease was speaking out and uh, saying that that something was very, very wrong with the government's claims. Uh, mad cows aren't diners, downers, he said. They're up and they're crazy. Uh, and it, so, uh, Dave, why don't you just tell us, and thank you very much for coming on the program, sure. what exactly happened to inspire you to suddenly speak out? Uh, well, I'll tell you exactly what happened. And it, and it went like this, okay? Yeah. That cow came in, good walking cow. I remember the cow very well. We don't get that many good walking cows over at Vern's. You know, we do downer cows. We do really sick, really tore up cows, just... They're generally a mess. But this cow was up, kind of a nice cow. Whenever we do get a nice cow, I go, hey, a nice cow. I asked the driver who it belonged to. He said, Sonny Dean's cow. Sonny Dean usually sent us pretty good stuff. So, you know, uh, she was a walking cow. She was in with a bunch of down cows. You know, I think she was the only one up on the trailer, in fact. So I killed a, I killed a down cow. There was a crippled cow after that cow. And then got to this walking cow. Uh now this cow was a little agitated in this trailer. When it first, when I first saw it, it was it looked all right. It was kind of kind eyed. It looked all right, but the driver was kind of poking at it with a hot shot. He wanted it to get off his trailer, and and it was it wasn't going to get it wasn't going to make that step down. It was going to turn around, run back over him, and trample them down. The cows back in there because it was going to go anywhere but out of the trailer. It didn't want to come out. It saw what was going on. It was wise to us. Yeah. So I asked the vet, "Did you have you seen enough of this cow?" He says, "Yeah, I guess I've seen it." He knew I was going to shoot it out of turn, but you know, usually we do all the downers first, and then we'll do the walkers. So I shot this cow out of turn just to save us all a lot of trouble. Went on into the building, didn't think nothing about it. Two weeks later, it comes back positive for BSE. I said, which cow was it? They wouldn't tell me. The USGA is being hushed mouth about it. Which cow was it? Couldn't find out. I kept working on the inspector, and finally the inspector said, well, it was a Sonny Dean cow. Said, and as soon as he said it was a Sonny Dean cow, I knew exactly which cow he was talking about. I ran up to the office. I looked at the paperwork, the kill sheet from that day. Third cow down. It was the third cow off that trailer. And I went, bam! I knew it was that cow. So I went back. I was back, and we were killing a lot of cows that day. It was. Uh, th this is December 26 now that I actually found out what the cow, which cow it was. So I went. I went back there. I'm killing cows. Law and inspector comes out and says, "We're not going to kill any more downers." 
USD says no more downers. I said, why? They said, well, if we don't kill any more downers, that we're not going to get any more mad cows. I said, you know, that's crap. This cow wasn't even a downer. First of all, mad cows are not downers. They're up. They're wild. They run around. That's why they call them mad cows, because they're up smashing the place up. You know, right. if they were laying there being calm, they'd call them calm cows, but they're not. They're mad cows. So I said, in the, in the second, second he told me that the USDA said we're not going to kill any more downers and that's going to take, take care of the problem, my whole life flashed before my eyes, and I'm not kidding. My heart was pounding, my face turned red, my ears were burning because I knew exactly what, I knew exactly what happened. They had just, by saying they're not going to kill any more downers, what they did was stop all, all the testing because we were only testing downers. Same with the, the few places that were testing, and we all just started in October. You know, the USDA said, "Well, we've had this testing program in place for years," which they did have it in place for years, but they didn't use it. They never took it. Right. We just started in October. We tested 83 cows. This was like the 83rd cow or something that we tested. And we found one that fast, and it, and it just—I was blown away. Now, why why did they start in October? I have no idea why they started in October. They must have had some inkling that something was going on. Maybe there's other mad cows, that the I presence of which they've hidden. I think they thought maybe they had stalled on that program as long as they could have. But we had we had been taking in a cow here and a cow there that had had, had, had the shaky head, the, the weird behavior and all this, and we, we point these out to the vet, and... and and they were starting to be more common. Yeah. We'd say, hey, this, this cow's acting funny. And he would say, well, it's pr- probably got a neck injury or whatnot. So we'd kill him. They, the USDA would take the brains, and I'd never hear anything about it. You know? They, and then I think the only reason that we heard about this particular cow is from what from what the inspector told me was the guy, one of the, the technicians at the lab in Iowa leaked it to the press, and I believe that's the only reason why we found out this one was a mad cow. So what you're saying then is that we would never, the public would never have even known about no. this. Plus, if I would have, if I would have run that cow around under the roof instead of taking it in with the downers, it wouldn't have got tested. We were only testing downers, but because I killed that cow outside the back door there, that technically made it a suspect, and I tested it because they gave us ten dollars a sample. <clears throat> well, it's a pretty good deal. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, let me read you the the uh, first paragraph of a story that appeared on the AP Wire about an hour ago. Okay. The Agriculture Department said Monday it is ending its search for additional cases of mad cow disease, even though officials yeah. have not found all the animals they sought yeah. after the nation's first case. They can't case. find them. You know, those Holsteins are black and white, and they all look pretty much the same. I I could recognize one cow for another, from another, you know, because I got an eye for cows and I've been around them. But these USDA guys are out of college and they don't know one cow from another. By now, everybody that's got one of those cows has run out in their pasture and cut their ear tags off so they can't be found. They don't want, they don't want the stigma of having a mad cow in their dairy. They don't want anybody to know. So they've run out there, they've torn up the paperwork, they've cut the ear tags off them cows and they're lost forever. So, in other words, what you're saying is that the United States is no longer able to tell whether or no. not no, those are completely mixed in. It's like it's like picking a jelly bean out of a jar. You know, they all look the same. They're, those cows are lost forever. What happens to us, the public? Well, you're going to be you either you got two choices. You got two choices. You can pretend nothing's happening, and keep eating your meat, and get sick and die, or you can stop buying meat. The only way to fix this is if you stop buying meat. If you got meat in your mouth right now, spit it out. Stop buying meat. The only way, because I've been after these people day and night for 40-some-odd days, and they just stand there. Their feet are stuck in the mud. They are not going to test because they are not going to test because they cannot afford to find another mad cow. One mad cow is a mad cow scare. You get two mad cows, that's, a, that's an epidemic. That's a panic. And what they mean by panic, they don't mean people running in the street. They mean people are going to stop buying meat. Big beef is going to lose a lot of money. So they would rather kill you and make profits to actually take care of this problem. So if you stop buying meat, I guarantee you within a week they're going to be testing every cow. And I'm not talking about testing one in a thousand or one in ten thousand. Don't buy a piece of meat until they're testing every cow. If that package doesn't say this meat has been tested, don't eat it. It's bad. Wow. You know, in Japan they test every cow slaughter. That's a fact. Right now, the only piece of meat I would dare eat would be a Japanese. It would be a Japanese beef. I just talked to a Japanese news crew. They're coming over here 
tomorrow or the next day, I said, bring me some meat. I'm starving to death. <laughs> the uh, Now, what about beef like from New Zealand uh, and places like that? Is I, don't, that... I don't know. I don't know about that. I, I haven't heard anything about that down there. I know they got nice cows down there, but I don't know if they're testing down there or not. But well, I know that been... Australia tests a tiny yeah, number of its that's cows. That's not good enough. No. No, it's not. Because, you know... If you're lucky enough to get the meat that came from that tiny amount that got tested, you're lucky because most of the meat I eat is going to come off a cow that ain't been tested. Well, thanks very much, Dave. You can hear more from Dave Louthan on the unknowncountry.com website. This is Whitley Streber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. The work of Linda Moulton Howe, the amazing work of Linda Moulton Howe, the world's greatest reporter of edge news and edge topics. She has got a website, earthfiles.com. Go there frequently. You will never, never forget what you find on earthfiles.com. The best website, the best reporting of its kind in the world. Linda Moulton Howe, earthfiles.com. Don't miss a single day. My friend William Henry, one of the oracles of our age, and now you can get every one of his books for a dollar off. These privately published volumes are an unknowncountry.com exclusive, and right now the price of this incredibly valuable information has never been better. Click on that store tab now because we cannot allow these prices to last long, and you need William Henry and his information. One reporter who loves mysteries is radio's leading science journalist, Linda Moulton Howe. She's an Emmy Award winning TV producer and reporter and editor for EarthFiles.com, the Internet's most respected edge science website. Here she is, Linda Moulton Howe. Thanks, Whitley. Since the middle of December, residents of Horton and Napoleon, Michigan, west of Ann Arbor, have been seeing some very strange lights and objects in the sky. Another mystery was a large, nearly perfectly round ice circle discovered on December 28th at Mud Lake near Horton. The ice circle was probably created by nature, but a local resident saw a bright light over the lake. As recently as this past weekend on Saturday, February 7th, and three nights before on February 4th, a Jackson, Michigan resident videotaped unidentified objects and sent me copies of the tapes which do show unusual objects in the sky. The man is a professional who works in computer technology support and has asked that I not use his real name. So for this radio update, I will call him John. John is a 36-year-old man who has lived in Jackson, Michigan all his life. He remembers seeing bizarre diamond-shaped oval-shaped and triangular-shaped craft and orange lights back in 1992 when there was another UFO flap over Napoleon. But he has not seen any strange aerial lights since then until now. He and other residents from the Napoleon, Horton, Litchfield area of Michigan south of Jackson have repeatedly seen unidentified lights. You can see images and reports about this Michigan phenomenon at my website, www.earthfiles.com. In fact, I have frames from John's most recent February 7th videotape. Just go to the headlines page and click on the top Michigan UFO story. In John's videotape, he was first near the Jackson County Airport and then traveled to a bank in downtown Jackson where he went to an ATM machine for some cash. And here is what happened next. And when I got near the ATM, I happened to notice that there were three curious orange dots in diagonal fashion. If you can think of a, a line 45 degrees from level, level ground, they were at that angle. And I, I stared at it for about five seconds because I wanted to see if it was moving, if it was an airplane or something else. And it was just stationary, so I assumed it was glare off of uh, some building or maybe telephone or power wires. And then I just went to use the ATM, which took me less than a minute. And then when I came back out, I looked in that direction again, and the three dots had actually moved, but they hadn't moved very far, which it didn't make sense to me because if 
it was a plane, then why wasn't it moving in the first place? And why didn't it move very far? It just it didn't make any sense to me. So I went back to my truck and I grabbed the camcorder again and I started uh, videotaping the object. And what appeared to be uh, three points of light in a line that were orange turned out to do what? Well, it was odd because the light on the left got really bright. And you can uh, see it in the videotape. And the dot that was in the middle actually was lower, like the bottom of a flat V shape. Mm -hmm. And then the light on the right was, was small, like the, the lower dot in the middle. And I videotaped that uh, for a short while while this object was crossing the sky. And then I, I pulled back to get perspective of the building. And I regret that now because what happened uh, after that is I tried to zoom back in on it and I lost it momentarily. And I used my eyes at that point to, to sight where it was at so I could have, have better luck zooming in on it again with the camcorder. And what I noticed then with my eyes is that the object dimmed overall. All three lights seemed to dim. The one that was the brightest on the left uh, dimmed the most. Uh, and they all dimmed until they were equal in brightness. And it was sort of like taking a light bulb and decreasing the power to it so it gets dimmer and dimmer. Right, like a rheostat. Yeah, like that. And then it can seemed to rise a little, and it continued across the sky, and I managed to reacquire it, and I followed it for a while. And it just looked like three small dots, and I never saw any blinking lights at all, which... An airplane should have blinking lights that time of night. Now, I've seen your videotape, and I'm so glad that you have been trying to capture these anomalies uh, over Napoleon on videotape. And the thing that struck me was something trying to camouflage itself in the sky so that most people would not pay attention. Yeah, that's the impression I get. Um, it's sort of like... They don't want to be that noticeable, but if you seem to take an interest in them, they will be noticeable. And I find it odd that as I would leave my apartment, uh, I would see this light in such a position in the sky where it would be noticeable to me. Because I sent you a picture of what I saw to the right, a daytime picture, uh, when I first sighted the object that ended up over the airport. Uh, and you can see there's a section of the sky where... To be noticeable, the object would have to fit in this section of the sky. In other words, there are trees around or other objects. You couldn't see it. Right. It was just in the right location at the right time for me to see it. And it stayed long enough for me to run into my apartment again and get my camcorder and leave again. And it was, seemed to be patient enough to wait until I took the longest route through all the stop signs to the airport. And then seemed to wait around for me to park and get my camcorder ready and to start videotaping. And it stuck around for a while, uh, you know, minutes, seven, eight, nine minutes, and I videotaped it. And it just seems odd to me that I was somehow always in the right place at the right time to lead me to this thing to start videotaping. And the same thing with the second object over downtown Jackson. The lights that weren't moving, I, I kind of get the odd feeling that they were parked there waiting to be noticed, and then when I ignored them, uh, used the ATM machine and came back out, then they started moving slowly. It's almost like it was choreographed, mm -hmm. um, not by me, but by whatever intelligence is behind these lights. Mm -hmm. It's like they, if you take an interest in them, they will reveal themselves a little bit. That's just my impression. And why you? Um, probably just because I'm curious, and I have a camcorder, and I look up at... I, had started paying attention again after the uh, ice circle, after you reported on that and the light associated with it. Um, that's when I uh, started, that's when I bought my camcorder and I just uh, waited and it started, seemed to start with the uh, Northern Hillsdale sighting that I had. That's when all of this seemed to start and it was only last Wednesday. And so if you hadn't heard my uh, earth files and radio reports on the ice circle in Horton, you wouldn't have gotten the camera and you wouldn't have been looking for these lights. Right, and Sunday night something else happened that was unusual. What? 
Sunday night, uh, I got the same friend to go out into the northern Hillsdale and southern Jackson area. We drove around for, I'd say, an hour and a half, and sometimes we parked, uh, but we didn't see anything. We went back to where he lives in the Horton area, which, incidentally, is not too far from the ice circle. Mm-hmm. Huh. And as I was, I actually had made the tape uh, at his house that I sent to you. And as I was leaving, um, I exited his house, and he was right behind me. And the first thing I saw was maybe 200 yards away, uh, over a tree line, there was an orange light, orange glowing light. And I, I immediately I said to my friend, uh, just half jokingly, I said, they're here. And he looked, and he saw the same light. And then I made a move uh, to my left to walk a couple of paces, and I was going to get out my camcorder and start shooting again, and it disappeared. Hmm. It was just gone. And it, <laughs> I think back on it now, and I sort of think that whatever these lights are, they have a sense of humor because we searched over a wide area for an hour and a half, two hours looking for these lights. And then at the exact moment we give up and I'm going home for the night, it's there. And then when I go to get uh, my camcorder, it's gone. From these ongoing sky mysteries in Napoleon, Michigan, we're going to go to the ground mysteries on Mars right after this break. This is Linda Moulton Howe reporting for Dreamland. Visit Linda Moulton Howe's phenomenal website, earthfiles.com. Do not miss it. Visit it every day. This is Whitley Strieber. We'll be right back. The work of Linda Moulton Howe, the amazing work of Linda Moulton Howe, the world's greatest reporter of edge news and edge topics. She has got a website, earthfiles.com. Go there frequently. You will never, never forget what you find on earthfiles.com. The best website, the best reporting of its kind in the world. Linda Moulton Howe, earthfiles.com. Don't miss a single day. My friend William Henry, one of the oracles of our age, and now you can get every one of his books for a dollar off. These privately published volumes are an unknowncountry.com exclusive, and right now the price of this incredibly valuable information has never been better. Click on that store tab now because we cannot allow these prices to last long, and you need William Henry and his information. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're talking to Linda Moulton Howe, and now back to Linda's report. Those rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, have been busy this week on Mars. Opportunity got up close to that bedrock near its landing site and surprised NASA and JPL planetary geologists when its spectrometer showed a very high percentage of sulfur in the rock. Opportunity also had problems even making its wheels move without slipping because the soil and rocks are covered with small round stones that have yet to be identified. This week, I talked about the implication of so much sulfur and the mysterious round rocks with Dr. Ronald Greeley, Regents Professor of Geology at Arizona State University, who is also one of the seven main chairmen of the Science Operations Working Group for the Spirit and Opportunity Missions. The measurements that have been made there uh, suggest that there's a very high percentage of sulfur present in the in the material and that there are these burials that had been seen and reported on earlier. Uh, those are still very curious features. Now, what is the implication of sulfur generally as you look at the picture of Mars? Well, sulfur is a is a common component in a lot of environments, but uh, such a high percentage is unusual, and this is what uh, leads some folks to consider the volcanic uh, origin, or at least volcanic processes to be involved. And what is the percentage of that with white stone now in terms of its sulfur content, and what else is there? Well, the, the percentages, I don't believe those data have been released yet, but, uh, but it's pretty high in comparison to most rocks we're familiar with. The additional findings are there are some uh, minerals that have been identified in the mini-test results that would suggest the presence of, of a couple of minerals that form, again, in the presence of water. <coughs> and in particular, if this is uh, a volcanic uh, terrain that we're looking at, for example, the accretionary lapilli idea, uh, then the presence of these minerals might suggest that this was a hydrothermal area. 
Mm. And sulfur is a component of, of such environments. And so uh, the <coughs> bedrock might be, if we were comparing it to the Earth, uh, might have happened, had an origin similar to, yeah, say, Yellowstone National Park. Yes, to some parts of Yellowstone, that's right. And all this is adding up to a question about whether uh, the place where opportunity came down originally might have been a uh, hot magma uh, coming up to the surface in some kind of volcanic activity or at least hot springs. Yeah, the... the uh the evidence is, is sort of pointing toward the presence of a hot environment, hot for some reason. That's, that's something that's under debate now. Volcanic activity, magma close to the surface is, is one possibility. The evidence we have so far is very suggestive that water was present. The question that's unanswered at this time is whether the water was a standing lake or a small sea or if it was diffused throughout the, the rocks in the subsurface. We, we don't have the answer to that yet, but the observation of things like the cross beds and, and determining what the origin of the spherules might be, uh, those will help answer that question of whether there was open water on the surface or not. And that's a fundamental question we're trying to, uh, trying to glean the answer for her. Now, the spherules or spherical uh, small objects they are about how big in the in the bedrock? They're about a millimeter, two millimeters across. And are they all over the slabs of rock? Or they seem to be pretty pervasive, yes. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, the the wheels on the rover were sort of slipping as uh, as the rover is driving across that surface. And it's sort of like trying to, to travel over ball bearings. There are so many of them that uh, that it makes the traction a little difficult. Wow, and has anybody ever seen anything quite like this anywhere on the Earth or the Moon? Well, we have seen uh, spherules of various forms, both on Earth and the Moon, and in some cases they are in, in similar concentrations. Uh, there are some impact craters on Earth that have uh, small spherules that resulted from the impact that melted the rock, and then they, the melted blobs fell back. Uh, to the surface and form deposits that are several feet thick of mostly the spherules. In other cases, as was seen uh, on the moon, there are deposits of uh, a volcanic glass that forms little spherules. So these uh, have been seen uh, on Earth and the moon in incomparable quantities, but again, trying to figure out what the origin is for the features we're seeing on Mars is what we're, we're trying to figure out right now. And is it fair to say that we we here on the Earth don't know of any context in which these kinds of spherules could be formed unless it was in some kind of a heat melt process? Uh, there is another another mechanism. I think I mentioned that they could be precipitates. In other words, they could be precipitated from, from water. Uh, think of it as a, a little grain of uh, dust within the water and chemical Precipitates like salt and, and other things would would form around that dust grain, and then those would settle down to the surface. So those can also form spherules. Is it fair at this point to say, as we're speaking on February 11th, that there still is not the smoking gun yet that a water like a lake uh, was uh, anywhere the uh, rovers have been so far? That That is correct. There is not definitive evidence for that at either site. And that's what you're all looking for. Right. Communications between NASA and the rovers don't always work well, Dr. Greeley said, and recent commands to Spirit to drive toward another crater called Bonneville have been delayed. But if all goes well, Spirit will be roving in yet another crater soon. So stay tuned. This is Linda Moulton Howe, reporter and editor of EarthFiles.com, reporting for Dreamland. Thanks very much, Linda. This is Whitley Strieber. Dreamland will be right back. Bud Hopkins and Carol Rainey, sight unseen, very simply, one of the best, the most convincing, the most complete, the most amazing books about abduction that you have ever read. When you read this and realize that science just rejects the whole thing out of hand, you'll understand something. Somebody out there is crazy, and it's not Bud Hopkins, and it's not Carol Rainey, and it's not the people this is happening to. The scientific community has dropped the ball big time. 
sight unseen. Don't miss it. Get it from the unknowncountry.com store. Get it today. Find out for yourself what's really going on here. The work of Linda Moulton Howe, the amazing work of Linda Moulton Howe, the world's greatest reporter of edge news and edge topics. She has got a website, earthfiles.com. Go there frequently. You will never, never forget what you find on earthfiles.com. The best website, the best reporting of its kind in the world. Linda Moulton Howe, earthfiles.com. Don't miss a single day. Well, I certainly hope you've enjoyed Dreamland as much as I did. What a show. First Bud Hopkins, then Linda Howe, interspersed with Dave Louthan, and it is extraordinarily controversial. You can listen to more about Dave Louthan, more from Dave Louthan, on the unknowncountry.com website. Just click on the Listen Now tab, and you'll find a longer interview with Dave at the very bottom of the page. Listeners, or subscribers rather, of course, can always download and keep this these extremely important interviews. Don't miss Dave Louth and take this seriously. I think that we're in a real problem with Mad Cow in this country, and the government is doing whatever it can to not acknowledge that. And uh, I think we're gonna it's gonna bite us, come back and bite us pretty soon. Uh, next, and in there another thing, if you look at the evidence that Bud Hopkins presented about close encounters and abductions, and the evidence that Linda presents every week, like she did this week, of videotaped UFO sightings, and then you listen to people like Jill Tarter of SETI saying it's all a bunch of bunk, what are, where do these people get off? Are they crazy? Are they unable to see the evidence before their eyes? I really have to wonder if we don't have a situation where our scientific community has literally lost it, lost it when it comes to the importance of these subjects. The evidence, the physical evidence, implants, uh, etc., is a videotape. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. The physical evidence would cr convince any jury on this planet that something weird is going on, and yet science won't touch it. That, in my opinion, is insane. It, I don't have any other way to put it. It is insane. The next week, by the way, on Dreamland, what a show we've got. We've got Christopher Knight with us. He is the author of the huge, massive bestseller, The Hiram Key, one of the great interpreters of masonry and the secrets of the Masons. There is nobody like it. His new book, The Book of Hiram, is going to be very exciting. Then for subscribers, Jack Houck. We're going to a PK party with Jack Houck. Jack is so into psychokinesis, he can he can do it almost at uh, the Berlin Wall is about to come down. There was a general strike in, uh, in um, Czechoslovakia. Poland was falling apart. The, uh, the um, Russian Empire, so to speak, was falling apart. And there were meetings and chaos at the United Nations. And this group of important people were driving down at 3 in the morning the, uh, down South Street, heading toward uh, the ferry terminal so that they could be f taken to uh, Governor's Island, where they would take helicopters to another international meeting, high, uh, highly placed people in these cars, and all of those cars were stopped, apparently by the UFO uh, interference with their electrical systems, and when they were stopped as if the audience had been put in a seat, then, and only then, the UFO above the nearby apartment building turned off all of its lights in full view of this procession of extremely important international figures, and Linda Cortila was floated out a 12-story window in full view of everybody, along with the aliens, and it, it, the story goes on from there. But essentially, it was as if the UFO occupants were making a demonstration. They could have done all this in complete yes. darkness and invisibility. And in fact, nobody saw Linda Cortila being returned to her apartment at the end of the abduction. So you have to assume that this is a deliberate act. I may be wrong there, but uh, all the evidence suggests it was. But my point is that invisibility, as it, it seems to have been from the beginning, an aspect of the abduction phenomenon, or the abduction technology, one might say. 
Yes. Uh, the only way these abductions can take place, and I mean, I had somebody taken off a balcony of a hotel in daytime in Beverly Hills. Uh, somebody was taken out of the 22nd story window of a building uh, next door to the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I mean, these things can't happen without witnesses. Now, tell so, us a little bit about th- th- those two cases. They both sound absolutely fascinating. Well, uh, <clears throat> the, the case that happened uh, in New York City, uh, a resident of the what is called the Museum Tower, the building next to the Museum of Modern Art. Right, a very asleep. lovely building, I might add. Yeah, she woke up, and the, and the uh, room was filled with light, and uh, she couldn't move, and uh, uh, her husband was not there. Org. And you can begin to explore the work of an extraordinary man, a real pioneer. We were talking about invisibility. What would be some of the possible technologies that might be behind this? Well, the, uh, of course, we don't really know, but uh, what we began to explore, uh, what Carol began to explore, actually, was what was happening in uh, various laboratories, and I would you know, hand it over the, to her at this yeah, point. In, in the military especially, but let me uh, just uh, speak briefly about the easiest way to, put, to um, become invisible is to work with the fact that in the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, which are all of the waves of energy, from microwaves, radio, infrared, x-rays, they're energy waves that make up the entire electromagnetic spectrum in the universe, we think, and that human beings can only see a tiny little range, a little spectrum in the visible spectrum. And craft could, for example, UFOs could take advantage of the fact that we have such a narrow range that we only see the tip of the iceberg or hear the tip of the iceberg of what's around us. The craft, um, and it's too long to go into, but it's related to the craft propulsion system as a possibility that it emits radiation at an energy level that's too high or too low for human perception and the you know a common um, commonly known aspect of that is a dog whistle because it, it's, it emits um, a sound that's far too high pitched for human beings to hear so we we invent all of these instruments in order to be able to deal with x-rays and gamma rays and radio waves which are also part of television um, but So that's just a a really basic way that a craft could work within the limits of what we can see and hear. Um, But then if you get into the actual technologies that are being developed, you know, the military is always uh, will be one that goes for the... We're going to have a few minutes of a special. There's something extraordinary happened this week. Dave Louthan will be with us. Dave is the man who on December 26th slaughtered, actually slaughtered with his own hands, the cow that was later discovered to be the mad cow that caused all the controversy. Now the USDA is saying the problem's over. Dave Louthan is saying not so. He's warning us, be careful. So stay with us after Bud because it, this is a very serious stuff. Bud, as wife Carol Rainey, and he have written a phenomenal new book called Sight Unseen, Science, UFO, Invisibility, and Transgenic Beings. Carol is a distinguished documentarist in her own right. She has done documentaries and dramas for PBS, for cable networks, international TV. Uh, Recently, she did a, a program called What's New About Menopause for NOVA. Uh, she has done uh, animated children's videos, uh, also other work for PBS. Uh, so these two extraordinary and distinguished people have come together to publish what I believe is very arguably the finest book on the abduction experience ever written, an awesome volume indeed, and welcome both of you to my radio program. Thanks a lot, Whitley. Well, thank you. That's a rather uh, <clears throat> extravagant and uh flattering introduction. I very much appreciate it. Oh, it's all entirely false. <laughs> no, I'm joking. It's not false. It's absolutely heartfelt, every bit of it. Right. And uh, now let's go, Bud, you know, I hardly know where to begin in, in uh, talking to, the two, to you or to the two of you, because uh, sight unseen, it, it, it gradually becomes overwhelming, the evidence that is presented in the book. 
and uh, uh, it, it just the the, the it, there are su- there is such so many there are so many directions it goes in. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the early, some of the witnesses and some of the things like invisibility that, that you discuss in the early part of the book. Because a, a large part of the book is about the, about accepting the... Next to her. Where he should have been. She was floated out the window, ultimately, and uh, she found that he had been floated out the window, too, into a craft that was hovering, let's say, 10 feet outside the window of the 22nd floor. Now, if... <laughs> If there was anybody walking anywhere around or looking out of the window of a neighboring building, they would have seen this happen. This was, let's say, two or three in the morning, but there are lots of people up. And uh, th- these sorts of things happen all the time. In my in my book, I, I go into uh, a case where two little girls were abducted uh, from their house in, uh, in Queens. Uh, this right. was a, a row house, and uh, uh, they, they remember some some little odd bits that suggest the abduction consciously, and the one little girl decided it's time to go home. That she'd they'd been playing in the basement uh, where they always played, where they had her friend had uh, her toys and so forth. And when they went outside, uh, she started home. There were police outside and neighbors and all kinds of people standing around, uh, along with uh, her friend's the other little girl's mother wailing and crying because the kids had disappeared and everyone was totally shocked where have you been and yeah. they said we've been in the basement and the police and everyone else apparently searched the whole building and the neighborhood was being searched and the mothers were calling out for the children and so forth so uh, this all took place in the afternoon and nobody saw them be- being taken out or, or put back so my god and when you get into this invisibility seems to be uh, essential and yet, uh, what happened for me, Whitley, was uh, from the beginning when we began to suspect this. But we need, to take a, we need to take just a little break here. Okay. This is Whitley Streber at Streamland. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back with Bud Hopkins and Carol Rainey. You need to learn more about Bud Hopkins and his work. Go to the Intruders Foundation website. That's intrudersfoundation. The reality of the technologies that makes this look makes the abduction experience look like magic and look like dreams when it's not. Uh, right. In a strange way, I think uh, the basic goal summarized <clears throat> of the book was to take the para out of paranormal. And to make uh, the uh, uh, the distance between normal uh, cutting edge human uh, technology and alien technology to to reduce that margin as much as possible, and I think that's uh, that's what the the book attempted. And and with Carol's involvement with uh, cutting edge science here, I think we, we've, we've we're getting close to that idea. Well, yeah. It let's you know uh, you you start off with the, there are ex- some cases in here like the Katharina case, which involves invisibility, and uh, and a person essentially disappearing from a public place. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? And please, Carol, just speak up when you want to. I'm asking you both right. about these these cases. <clears throat> well, Whitney, the thing about uh, Katharina and about the idea of invisibility and what we mean by that is that during abductions, uh, most, if not practically all of the time, uh, researchers have come, like myself, have come to believe that the UFO is unseeable by any potential witnesses. Abductions could take place in downtown Manhattan or Paris or Chicago, and nobody sees the craft. No one also sees the aliens uh, coming down a beam of light or whatever and entering a building, and no one sees the abductees being lifted back up into the craft. Uh, the only exception being, of course, the uh, Linda Cortilla case, which was uh, deliberately staged so the maximum number of people would see it. But we've always... Now, when you say deliberately staged so the maximum number of people would see it, that's quite a statement. Why do you say that? Well, <clears throat> because, I mean, that's to get into that case, uh, which is yeah, complicated go ahead. enough. Let's, that's all right. We can get into it a little bit. But uh, the basic point here was... Uh, a procession of cars with diplomats aboard uh, heading down South Street on the east side of Manhattan in 1989 and 
at the end of November, and this was right at the time international politics were absolutely a boil. Uh, 